Well, I'm almost done with this uh, oscilloscope, this uh, OL-1, this Heath kit, for those of you who have been following it. And you recall in the beginning, I had a couple of these things that were loose. These, They were just sort of slid in there like that. And that was it. And then, you know, I, I, they just came right out. And I asked questions about, does anybody know, you know, how these things operate? I mean, was this like some homemade deal or something? Or, Well, one guy said, no, what's supposed to happen here is you push them in until they snap. Well, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at first. So I got looking at it tonight, really studying it. And guess what? Take a look at the aluminum thing right here. You see that little chrome, that little shiny ridge right there? A little shiny ridge right there. Then if you turn it around the other side, there's another little shiny ridge on the other side. Well, that's actually sunk in a little bit, if you can see it. Barely sunk in. And then, of course, you see the edge is beveled. It's beveled there, and it's beveled on the other side as well. So the guy that said that they push in the snap is 100% correct. Uh, in fact, I was able to get this one in, and I was able to get the one in here that's on this knob here. And they're in there nice and snug. The problem is uh, what I had to do with each one, if you, uh, the, the hip or the, the flat area right here, let me zoom in again. This flat area right here is too rough on both sides when they were when they were made. So what I'm going to have to do is file them down a little bit because it's just too too tight of a fit. I can't even hardly get it in there. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, file them down a little flatter on each side. Get some of those rough ridges out of there. As you can see, it looks like machine marks or something. And then what happens is it's when you push it in, this little snap ring, let me see if I can get a focus here for you, yeah. See that little snap ring right there? That's when you shove it in, that snap ring, which moves, it just swivels around there as you can see. That snap ring will pop up over the beveled edge and up over and into, this, into that slot on each side. And that's how they snap in. Now those slots aren't very deep, but it's enough for these for this these snap rings to catch it so let me see if I can file those flat spots down a little bit and get that thing in there and all I did was take this flat side you see put it right up against the file and just went back and forth a few times gave it a few laps on both sides and I got it down nice and smooth and you can see now fits right in there just as slick as can be now the problem is now that I've got it where the you know those those flat sides will go in, all I have to do is now is slightly tap it, and it will tap up over the top. Let me zoom in a little closer. I think it will tap up over the top just like I did with the others. So let's see if it'll work. And there she is, nice and snug as a bug in a rug. Not a problem. She works great. And if I ever need to pull it out, all I have to do is loosen up that snap ring and it'll come right back out again. Now here's another survey I took online. You'll remember last time it was about finances and then, you know, I'm a uh, Peter Lynch kind of guy. Well, this is a political one I took. A whole bunch of questions. When it was all done, I agree or I side with Donald Trump on 96% of the uh, issues. How about that, huh? Yeah, I thought that. I like taking these little quizzes and things like that. It kind of gives you an idea of sometimes they really surprise you. Today, we are going to try to make our own Korean kimchi. I've never given it a try. This will be the traditional kimchi or something called pogi kimchi, P-O-G-I. And we're going to be using this cabbage. Uh, it, this is called Napa cabbage. And the first thing I have to do is get rid of some of these old limp leaves that have to go. I'm going to kind of trim this thing up and make it look a little, little more lively. And then we'll come back. All right, I'm not going to make a pile of this stuff. You know, just one head of Napa cabbage. By the way, the Napa cabbage comes out in the fall, usually. Just before winter. That's when you really want to get your freshest stuff. 
Now what I'm going to do, I've already cut the, the butt off a little bit. I didn't cut it real deep, just enough to get it off. I'm going to take the knife and I'm going to cut it about this deep in. That's all, all the way down. Then I'm going to take my hands and stick my thumbs up in there and I'm going to split it into two pieces. I'm not going to cut it, I'm going to split it. And it'll separate, once I get this cut made, it'll separate all the way up, all on its own. Then I'm going to uh, wet it down real good. I'm going to put it under the sink and get it all nice and wet. And then uh, we're going to salt it. And I'll show you how all that's done. All right, the cut's been made. I'm just going to take my hand. I'm just going to split it apart all the way up, all the way up. Take both hands and just separate it. Now that it's separated, I'm going to cut it again. I'm going to cut it down through here, about that deep in. I'm going to cut it down through here, about that deep in, right in the middle of that, that stump right there. Just cut it about like that, about like that. The next step is to dip this thing down in some water. Normally you would use, you know, like a plastic container full of water, and then you'd go ahead and dip it down in there. And that's to make it wet so the salt will stick to it. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do it under the faucet. Get it all nice and wet down between the leaves on both of them. And then once that's all done, then we'll go ahead and salt it. All right, the idea here, now that everything is wet, is to take some salt. I'm using sea salt. You just kind of sprinkle it around each leaf, okay? Then I'll separate the next leaf, sprinkle it around each leaf. You get this one over here. We're going to let this stuff get salted and soak for, oh my goodness, it's probably going to soak for about... And get it soaking real good with some salt. Get it all over the place here. Down in here. But I'm going to separate it with both hands and make sure I get it all the way down. We're going to let it soak for about two hours, but we're going to flip it about every 30 minutes, okay? It's been about 30 minutes, so now it's time to flip our cabbage around. Like so. And another 30 minutes from now, we'll flip it back again. Just like that. You don't need to cover it, but I, I kind of like the idea of keeping a cover on it while it's soaking in the salt. Later on, when we're all done, after you know, after this thing has been flipped a couple more times and the uh, two hours go by, then we'll go ahead and wash all that salt off those leaves. While the uh, Napa cabbage uh, continues to soak in the salt, we'll go over all the ingredients we're going to be needing to make the paste. It'll be a red hot paste with all kinds of stuff in it that we're going to rub on each leaf top and bottom. Now we're going to need some fish sauce of course and some hot pepper uh, paste which I will you know I'm not going to make it super duper hot make it to about my taste I'm going to need a little bit of salted shrimp these are a little bit of tiny salted shrimps and a carrot and some chives and normally you use uh, Korean chives but they didn't have any so I'll use my own I'll chop up a few not too much we're just going to kind of mince them for flavor I'm going to chop up an onion some ginger and of course garlic and we're going to add a little bit of uh, light brown sugar and some what's called sweet rice flour by Machinko pretty good stuff just a couple of tablespoons of that and some scallions and we're also going to add uh, some a Korean radish. Two cups of water. We're going to put two tablespoons of this stuff here. You can find this uh, Machinko sweet rice flour in an Asian store, an Asian food store. And then we're going to put a couple of uh, tea, uh, tablespoons of brown sugar. We're going to mix all that together over the stove and kind of heat it and get it nice and dissolved. Now we're not going to boil this stuff. We're just going to kind of warm it up to where it'll uh, it get pretty hot to where it'll totally dissolve, you know. Anyway, there's the water and the sweet rice flour. We'll go ahead and add the uh, add a couple of tablespoons of brown sugar. There's one, one and a half. Uh, come on, baby, about another half is what we need. That's about it right there. Okay. Now we'll just warm that until she dissolves completely and then we're going to take it off the heat and let it cool down. By the way, this uh, sweet rice flour um, comes from short grain sweet rice. And I guess they just use it as a thickening agent similar to baking soda or baking powder, I guess. 
Anyway, that's what it says about it. I don't know much about it myself other than that. I don't know where that matter of fact, where was it even done? It's done in uh, a coat of farms out in uh, south, south, uh, Dos Palos, California. Hmm, never been there. Anyway, we're going to let it thicken up a little bit, a little bit more, let it warm up a little bit more, and then we'll take it off the stove. And the final turn. See how it's beginning to get a little bit limp, a little bit wimpy? That's what you want. Now, you, you know, somebody might ask, well, can I use regular cabbage to do this with? Yeah, you could, but it won't taste the same. And when we get ready to put on the kimchi sauce on each of the individual leaves, it would probably be a lot difficult. Now, we're going to remember, if you'll recall, we initially, when we cut this thing, we cut it partially through on the end here, remember? Now, once this stuff is, I get it all washed off and everything, I'm or prior to getting it washed off I'm going to go ahead and split it up here and we'll wash it off individually like that It'd be a lot easier in handling this great big one just going to, just going to tear it all the way up now it won't be cut just tear it I guess if you cut it it wouldn't make any difference but it's, I think it's better to just kind of tear it we have to make a puree and I'm going to use the old uh, spice grinder I tried using a blender and it just didn't work so well all it did was basically chop it up so I'm going to use the old spice grinder and coffee grinder that I got one of my grandsons gave it to me for Christmas and uh, we're gonna, first thing we're gonna do is put a little garlic in there of course I like a lot of garlic that one piece wouldn't that one piece would not make it would it? of course not well, I'm not gonna waste it there we go now we'll put a little bit more garlic I like lots of garlic all right now we're gonna go ahead and put all oh, about a half of a average size apple in there that I've chopped it up into chunks and here's another chunk of it. No, that's uh, ginger. A couple of pieces. Of wood. This is the one I want right here. This is the rest of the apple. And we're going to put maybe a couple of tablespoons of ginger in there. And we're going to throw maybe a half an onion, a half an onion. Get that in there. And then we're going to go ahead and mix it all up. There may be something else i got to add to it, but I don't think so. I think I got it all. Let's go ahead and get it going. Then one other thing you can add to this. Uh, you can add some plum extract. Yeah, I imagine some, there's uh, probably some other kind of fruit extracts you can add to it. They didn't have any at the store, so we're not going to go with this. But we are going to add the apple, like I said. So, here we go. Let's see if it works. All right, I think that's got it. Oh, yeah, that looks real good. I tell you, you couldn't do that with the blender. This little rice or our spice grinder did a good job. All right, our mixture from the stove has now been cooled down. I've got it in this big old bowl right here. What we're going to do now is add a half a cup of fish sauce, like so. Now I bought some of this uh, fish sauce that's that's uh, premium. It's called uh, it's called premium, and the reason I bought it was the lady told me, you know, there's the non-premium and the premium. She said if you get the non-premium, what you actually get, you get sediment in the bottom of the jar after a while. Whereas where you buy premium, you don't get that sediment. I said, well, good. Give me the premium. Then we have to take a quarter cup of this uh, salted shrimp, these little tiny salted shrimps. I love shrimp. Now, you don't have to use shrimp. You can use hamburger, pork, whatever you want, okay? I happen to like shrimp. And what we're going to do is squeeze the juice out. I'm going to put my finger on here. If I can do this one-handed, I'm going to squeeze the juice out like so, okay? Then we're going to put that on the cutting board. We're going to chop that up real fine with my knife here. I mean, we're really going to cut it up really fine, okay? We're just about at the end. The shrimp is chopped up, and I've got uh, some puree now to add to this same mixture where we put the fish sauce. So I'm going to go ahead and get that all in there. I'll have to get probably one of those rubber spatulas to scrape it all out. I'll be back with you when that's done. All right, that's all in and mixed up. Now I have to take all the vegetables. I have chives, green onions, carrots, and Korean radish all cut into a stick length. You know, they call it matchsticks. Uh, and I've got my shrimp. Uh, incidentally, uh, one other lady I saw who made kimchi, she uh, not only used shrimp, she used dried cod. Little strips of dried cod, you know, probably no bigger than this right here in a bag. She chopped them up the same exact way I did this right here. And, you know, once you put it in, it rehydrates and gives you another flavor to add to it. So let's get all this stuff in here. 
Now for the best part. Oh, the best part. This is what gives it its kimchi taste. What we have here is powdered uh, Korean red pepper, chili pepper, in a bag. Pretty expensive stuff, but it's a big bag and lasts a long time, especially for me since I won't be making kimchi every day, you know, like the Koreans do. This is called Gurukachu. Gurukachu, Gurukachu, I think is the way it's pronounced. And what we're going to do is take a couple of, uh, maybe one and a half, uh, now I'm going to fill this up to a half a cup. I'm going to put one and a half cups into our mixture, stir it around, and then we're going to taste it. See if it, you know, if it tastes the way I like it. If it doesn't, we're going to add some more. So let's get this stuff in there. Here's where it turns red and becomes kimchi. Here goes the first one. Look at that deep, rich red. Boy, I'll tell you what, that really gets, starts giving. What I'm going to do is make a big old thick paste out of this is what I'm going to do. And then we're going to be smearing it. I was going to smear it, you know, all over the cabbage. You know, pick up each leaf and smear it the way Munji told us to do it. However, I ran into another Korean lady that she makes it more to, to the way I want. I'm going to cut the cabbage up into pieces about that long. And then I'm going to put all this sauce over the top and then I'm going to mix it all around. Because when I take it out of the... Uh, when I take it out of the jar that we're going to be storing it in, I want it to be already cut. Uh, the way Manji did hers was she smeared it around the leaves and then, you know, top and bottom of each leaf, along, you know, the entire length of the cabbage. And then she folded it in half and stored it that way. And when she wanted it, she would take it out of the jar and cut it up at that time. Nah, I don't want to do that. I want it to be cut up at the time I put it in the jar. So let's add a little more of that pepper. I, I hope this turns out. If it doesn't, I'm going to be highly upset. All right, after one and a half cups, we've got the consistency right. Now I need to taste it. If, you know, if it doesn't taste good, I'm gonna be really perturbed here. I'm doing a lot of work on this doing this. Let me taste it. Mm. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what, that pepper makes all the difference in the world. Mm. Oh my God, that's good. Holy mackerel. Now at this stage of the game, you can add anything you want to it. You can, you know, beef it up a little more. You want more ginger? Put it in. You want more onion? Put it in. Wow, that is really good. Not too hot. Just the way I like it. I can't believe it. This is what you call beginner's luck, I think. Anyway, now we have to get it on the cabbage. All right, here goes. I got it all chopped up. I'm going to put half of it in here. Then I'm going to add a little bit of this stuff to it. And I'm going to mix it all by hand using these gloves. You try using and putting your hands in that hot pepper. From what I understand, it's pretty rough, you know, since I've never made this before. I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit as I go, like so. Let me just go ahead and mix it all by hand. Oh, that's going to be fun. It is time for the official taste test. And then, of course, you know, you can't just do that. My first attempt at kimchi, you just can't do that with a fork. No, we got to get out the old chopsticks. Actual chopsticks. Let me see if I can get this thing and see if I can even remember how to use the chopsticks. I'm going to give it the old taste test. Here we go. If it's no good, it's all going in the garbage. <laughs> mm, holy mackerel. Give me, no more, give me some more. If I get these chopsticks to work, these chopsticks never do work right. Oh, look at that. Mm. Holy mackerel, that's good. Mm. That is delicious. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the best kimchi I've ever tasted. Holy mackerel. Mm, give me some more of that. After I cut up all those trees this past uh, fall that I had taken down, and I just sort of stacked the wood right here. I know a person who wants it. And I'm going to go ahead and give it to him, but I told him, look, just let it season through the spring, and then you can come get it. He said, okay, that'll be fine. Anyway, there's, there's elm in there, and there's oak, and uh, there's also cherry. Right there is some of the cherry wood right in that area right here. I kind of stacked it up. Well, I've got a friend that I, at, named Richard who I work with, and he has a lathe, a uh, wood lathe at, at home, and he likes to piddle around with that lathe and make little things. You know, he's certainly no expert. He's like me. We kind of muddle around and do a you know pretty acceptable job, but it's certainly not an expert level. But anyway, he said, do you mind if I come over and look through your wood pile and see if you got any cherry wood? I said, well, I know I've got cherry. Come on over and find what you want. Take what you want. So he came over and he grabbed uh, two or three pieces of that cherry. And uh, they were some pretty big around uh, pieces. And uh, 
larger than uh, that one right there. And he took them home and he made a few things and he talked to me uh, yesterday after, we're, after we got to work and he said, you know, I could use a couple more cherry uh, pieces if you got it. I said, Richard, the pile is yours. Come over and take all the cherry you want. So let me show you what he did with that wood. He made Wifey a little candle holder bowl on his lathe. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Out of the wood that was grown on our property. I thought that was really nice of him to do that. And he put a bunch of candy in it for for Christmas. And he said, as soon as the candy's gone, you can stick you a, stick you a, a little round, flat metal housed candle in there. And it'll look real nice. Or, or a nice size candle, you know. I thought he did a really good job on that thing. It looks really nice. I particularly like the center here where he got the center of the wood. This, uh, he didn't perfectly center it, which is not the way it's supposed to be. You know, it's just, it just has more... I don't know, it just has more interest to it, I think. I think it's pretty slick. But, you know, even though Richard is not a subscriber to our channel, we still know what that means. Shout out to my friend and wifey's friend, Richard. A few days ago, while I was at the Asian food market, uh, you know, the Oriental food market, where I got all my Korean, you know, seasoning and all that jazz, the lady that ran the place, she was Filipino. Her name was Wilma, and she, she you know, she was showing me different things throughout the store. And she said, you know, you ever heard of a bimbop? I said, well, yeah, I have. And she says, well, apparently, from what people tell me, now keep in mind, this lady's Filipino, so, but anyway, this is Korean. And she said, uh, people tell her that this is as close as you can get to, you know, making it by hand. And it's, uh, it's pre-packaged, which is frozen. It's kind of, oh, I look at it as a Korean TV dinner. <laughs> anyway, what you do is you'd, uh, you heat this thing up really hot for about three minutes. And then they give you a sauce in a plastic package that you dump over it. It looks like this when you first get it all separated, okay? But after you dump your sauce on, like they have here in the center, right there, in that little plastic pack, then you take your spoon, you mix it all together. And then, uh, you know, that's the way you're supposed to eat the bimbap. It's got rice in there and, uh, you know, different things, carrots and whatnot. I'll tell you what, it's pretty darn good. But of course, understand, I've never, I've never eaten good bimbap uh, made by a Korean lady. I've only... I've had it at restaurants uh, a couple of times when I was in Korea, but I wasn't sure really what I was eating at the time. It may not have even been bibimbap. Bim I'm just kind of thinking it was. This is pretty good, but it may not be perfect. So, But I do plan to make some of this on my own in the future. I decided to go ahead and check out the old OH-1 oscilloscope and see if it's working other than, you know, just a trace. And I have it hooked up to a radio chassis that's still a little flaky. But it'll do the job for now. I, I know my volume pot's a little messed up. I'm going to probably have to get a new one. But let's go ahead and crank it up and see, watch what happens. Not too shabby, huh? This knob slews it up and down, like so. This, slot, this knob right here, this is the vertical centering. And of course, this is a vertical gain. This is the vertical gain. I've got the uh, I got the probe. It's a ten times probe. I have it hooked to the output plate, the output tube plate. This this gives me this will increase the the size on you know the vertical size. Not too shabby. Nice little scope for somebody that would like to rebuild one or, or get it going and use it for himself. It's kind of neat, you know. It doesn't do much, of course, but <laughs> you'd probably wind up blowing it up. You'll need one of these. Uh, one of these little Dumaflaches right here to make it work. I got one that has uh, both of the things are black, unfortunately, but the one with the tab on the side, if you can see that tab right there where my thumb is, that's the negative. So that goes into black down here. I, I, I wanted to find one that was red and black. I may wind up just painting it red. And I just put that in there like that and hook it up to my 10 times probe. If I can get it in there, hang on. All right, there we go. I've got it in there, and I've just got it hooked up to a 10 times probe. Pretty neat little item. This one here, the only thing I have left really to do on it is to find a 0.1 microfarad 1200 volt capacitor 
to put in it, but it's all painted, looking real nice. Shined up the handle and coated it with some uh, enamel to keep it shiny. And uh, I had to do a little knob, switch it around. I had a couple of, some of these knobs were cracked and busted. I didn't know about it. So I, I dug around in my, you know, my knob bag that I have, and I came up with these two for here, matching on each side, and the rest of the original. They'll work fine. That's all I need. So give it a shot. Anyway, that's the end of this video. We'll go ahead and wrap it up for here. And I hope you all learned something. Until next time, this is John. One more thing before we close out, which is usually the case, you know. <laughs> For those of you who keep up with my videos, you know that a while back I came up with the brilliant idea of removing the 5U42 rectifier out of here. And with the intent of converting it to solid state using a couple of diodes. And uh, then later on I had planned to put a couple of high-powered resistors in there to put in series, which would bring the voltage back in line. You know, once you go with this your B plus voltage goes up. It went up about 30 volts, which meant I had to bring it back down. Well, you know, I was going to wait until, you know, discuss the whole procedure with Brandon, my electronics mentor, but as you know, he's been under the weather still, and I haven't had contact with him other than a Christmas card from his wife that was sent. Anyway, so I foraged around on my own, and I wound up back on the Antique Radio Forum, and I posted a you know, a thread about this, and boy, did I get an education. Well, guess what? In the next video, I'm going to pass along what I learned to all you folks that might be interested in something like this, you know, converting a boat anchor over from tube to solid state. You might be surprised at some of the answers I got. Custom tour boys, a custom. Thank you.